Okay, we're going to do our panel discussion now. I'm going to ask Gary Jones to come up. Gary, the audience is suitably relaxed. He is the chief exec of eWater. And joining him on the stage, we've got Lisa Curry, who's the manager of water strategy at City of Sydney. Welcome, Lisa. Stuart White, who's the director of the Institute of Sustainable Futures. Thank you, Stuart. And Daniel Lambert, who's going to be joining us later as well, who is the Australasian water leader for Arup. Please give our panel discussion people a massive round. Not much. Keep going. We'll okay. get you. So my name is Gary Jones, uh, but tonight, and I've been a water scientist for 30 years. But tonight, my job is to be Tony Jones, and to lead us into what you've just heard is going to be a very in innovative Q&A session. We're going to start that though to get the ball rolling with three experts, I can call them that, on water, to just to start the conversation. We've had our speed dating before, some great presentations around water policy, water management, innovation, some amazing technology here, a lot of which was developed here in Sydney at the University of New South Wales, now used all over the world. So great stuff out of Australia. But to talk about urban water management in a bit more detail. So um, I'm going to start with Stuart. Stuart's a leading academic, but an academic who's really connected to policy and sustainability and energy and water. Now, Stu, and I know that you've been writing about this idea of fourth generation urban water infrastructure. Now, I don't think I actually know what the first three generations were, but maybe you could tell us some of these ideas and why they're kind of relevant to our conversation today, tonight. Great, thanks Gary. And uh, I don't need to tell you about the first two because Kaya put them up uh, in a very lucid way. Uh, the first one, picture the tank stream, uh, slops thrown out window, sewage running down the streets, tank stream was polluted so the first sewers were built and this was happening all across Europe to prevent cholera, to fight fire, to provide prevent flooding. So the first generation was the un decentralised but unmanaged. Second generation we built the beautiful sewers of Paris, uh, the somewhat beautiful sewer running to Bondi uh, and so on. So the second generation was centralised but future, it didn't really future care. Future tourist destinations Future as well, tourist yeah, destinations, that's right. that's right. Let's put the sewage there. And uh, so the second generation was just that centralisation to prevent cholera, to prevent fire, to prevent flooding. But then the third generation is where we've been sticking things on the end of that to try and fix it up. Very expensive, very energy intensive, very chemical intensive and so on. So an end of pipe solutions, if you like, try and fix the problems of that significant things which allowed our cities to grow and develop. But we're coming into this fourth generation and the examples that we've heard from, from flow systems, uh, from Sydney Water, uh, from a whole range of others, and we're, we're seeing a, uh, the example of the work we did helping Wide Bay Water to put smart meters in there, 20,000 meters to replace them in order to be able to monitor what customers are doing. The, the humble dual flush toilet, which was actually an Australian invention, which yeah. dramatically reduced by 75% the water used in, in flushing toilets, right through to now urine diverting toilets, which we've been trialling in our building, uh, which separate out the phosphorus, which is a globally critical resource that in future we'll be taking that out of the system. Uh, the advice we gave to the New South Wales government that they didn't need to build a desal plant in order to have the benefits of being able to build it in time. So a just in time rather than a just in case uh, strategy. Now of course that uh, advice was heeded for 12 months but uh, the rest is history as they say. Uh, so that ultra efficiency which we need to think about for uh, saving water and ultimately a different network. A network that's actually a much more sophisticated, uh, a much more complex if you like, but exemplified by the, the work that we've been proud to be part of with Central Park. So that's the sort of future of 2040, as a fourth generation emerging, a more complex picture where the systems are integrated, and we'll hear a bit more about that from Daniel as well. Yeah, so Daniel, that's a good segue, thanks for that. So Daniel, you just released a report with Arup, your company in Sydney Water, on the future of water in, in, in the world, but in Sydney, 2040. We've heard a lot about the innovations, but are there, what's holding us back? Is something holding us back? Is it just a matter of doing it? Someone paying for it? Are there, are there real challenges there that are not just about building infrastructure? How do you see that from your point of view, working with the private sector, working with the public sector? Well, I think that it's, it's an interesting question. And the, the study we did was actually looking at 2040 as well and what are some of the scenarios for the future and what, that, what might that mean for the urban water industry and looking at centralisation versus decentralisation, integration versus segregation of utilities and and some of the some of the different drivers that that our industry is going to face, and as Kaya alluded to before, um, one of the things we looked at was 
the fact that it's not necessarily going to be about the industry being all about centralisation or decentralisation, but it's about how do we combine the different approaches to, to develop the best solutions for cities such as Sydney. And Sydney Water's doing some amazing work, City of Sydney's doing some amazing work, and there's fantastic things happening in Sydney and around Australia. But it's about being prepared to think about, well, what, what might the future look like so we can prepare for it and plan for it, and, and technology, water pricing, privatisation, um, different companies being involved in, in um, supplying water and operating water systems rather than just one. So there's going to be some significant changes and we need to be prepared to actually adapt our, our, our city to, to, to um, accommodate those changes and be flexible. So just to follow up on that, one of the big changes we hear about around Sydney and everywhere, this idea of contestability for water, whether it's for water supply, we heard from, uh, from uh, Lisa about that, for using recycled water, where does the private sector come into this you see now? Do they become a bigger and bigger player, whether that's individuals, companies? Do you see that shift from public sector, private sector, management of water in the urban areas? How do you see that? I don't necessarily... Th I don't think we're going to see full privatisation of our water utilities, mm. uh, but I think we are going to see more private operators uh, in, in locations where, they might make, where it might make economic sense. So I think we're going to see uh, the Sydney waters of the world and the other water authorities around Australia working more closely with the private sector to develop um, bespoke solutions. So Lisa, you look after water strategy for the city of Sydney and, and there's many things in Australia. It's local government. You know, you're a wealthy local government, but you're still local government. I say, well, local government gets the, you know, handed all these things from the federal government, from the state government. They say, look, here's a wonderful policy. Go and implement it. So how is the city of Sydney looking forward? How is it going to handle these, you know, drive for change, drive for sustainability? Thanks, Gary. So at the City of Sydney, we have a vision for a water-sensitive city. So just like Bryony introduced earlier, um, where water is valued as the precious resource that it is. And we're trying to build resilience to climate, uh, resilience um, in our city by reducing um, our reliance on drinking water, but at the same time keeping our city clean, um, our parks green and cool, um, and also our waterways clean. So our vision is documented in a, our de decentralised water master plan. Um, and we've got targets, very ambitious targets that we've set for ourselves in three areas. That's water efficiency. So it's always um, our first priority to save water and it's much cheaper to save water than to introduce other solutions. So that can be done in several ways. Um, in your home, as you all know, through water efficient uh, fixtures and fittings, um, your taps, shower heads, your washing machines. Um, the second area is in water recycling. So by looking at um, alternative water sources, we can reduce our reliance on, on um, our precious water resources. Um, and at the same time, as I mentioned, um, keeping our parks green and cool. So, and the third area is in water quality. So we, we're trying to um, um, reduce pollution that's running off our streets in, in the form of stormwater that's discharged into our waterways. Um, and Bryony mentioned water sensitive urban design earlier and we're implementing several systems like that such as rain gardens and swales and bioretention systems. So they're designed to slow down our stormwater when it hits um, our, our land and also at the same time clean it up. So when it gets to our waterway, it's a lot cleaner and our waterways are, are much nicer um, places to be and to live within. It all sounds kind of expensive to me. I mean, it sounds fantastic and, you know, I work in the industry, but it kind of sounds expensive. And Stuart, I mean, you're, I think you're an economist by training. Mm -hmm. Who's going to pay for all this? How are we going to pay for it, do you reckon? Someone's going to have to pay somewhere along the line, I assume. One of the issues that we are often researching, whether it's in uh, water or energy or transport or solid waste and so on, is the avoided cost. And this is often what's not counted. And uh, in energy, it's very clear, we've, uh, we've got huge potential for avoiding the cost of the distribution network. Uh, in water, it's, uh, n this concept is newer, uh, but it's the same principles apply. I mean, water is an extremely heavy commodity, so transporting it uh, is, um, is quite expensive, the infrastructure for doing that. Uh, and the sewer configuration itself, the sewers under our feet, 
are a huge multi-billion dollar asset. So what we need to do is to say, let's take the long view. And this is one of the problems, is that historically we have not taken the long view and we've not considered the sewer system, the stormwater system and the water supply system as an integrated whole, which of course is a principle that Brian was mentioning in terms of integrated uh, water management, water sense of urban design. If we do that, then we often get quite different answers to the question about what's economic in the long run. Uh, and that's even before we take into account those things which are traditionally not counted, such as the role of people and the benefits to, to people that Brian also mentioned. Now, we have got a, a proper interesting Q&A session happening where we're going to do some exciting things in a minute. But I just wonder, is there anyone in the room, in the, we've got a few more minutes for money, who's got any burning questions? I'd like to ask the panel as a way of kind of getting that conversation going. Anyone got anything that's on their mind about water, about energy, about uh, sustainability? Anyone? Yeah, please. I've got a microphone here. There you go. Please. Um, to the panel in general. Why doesn't it seem that there are any government incentives, be it local, be it state or national, that really promotes some renewable energy, some sustainability tax incentive or a, uh, a write-off in the individual's private home? So we could recycle our own water, we could have grey water, but then the council say, oh, you can't drink your grey water, but we can have a purifying system that we've already talked about tonight. Lisa, and rainwater there? tanks. Why, why doesn't the government, being all those sections, do something? Lisa, you want to go? Yeah, thank you. We just introduced a um, grant program, actually, um, not for households, but for residential apartments, where um, we are promoting grants for water efficient fixtures and fittings in residential apartments, and that's a way of reducing water consumption. Um, and we also have environmental upgrade agreements as well, which we can talk about more um, at another, you know, later on in the Q&A. Um, but that's another opportunity where people can access, um, you know, these types of savings. I think there were some, but you'll find they disappeared after the drought broke, you know, or broke in Vertica. So we yeah. did have that phase of, you know, governments investing in subsidised rainwater tanks, free shower heads, that sort of thing. But it kind of went, didn't it? Most of it I, went anyway. I think Sydney Water were yeah. implementing systems like that. And we're, we're looking at residential apartments, um, first of all, as a priority, because they're our highest water users in our local government area. So that's why we're, we're starting with that. Um, but you know, hopefully as our programs continue, we can look at, at individual households as well. Daniel, I know you do a lot of work outside of Australia, you have done in the past. Singapore, you know, Singapore's had, we've been one of the world's leaders in, you know, wastewater recycling and, you know, they drink recycled sewage in Singapore. Do you think we're going to be drinking recycled sewage in Sydney in the next 10 years? If we hadn't built desal plants, we probably would. <laughs> um, I think that yeah, there's some different drivers and we got very close to, to that point, particularly up in Queensland. Uh, but at the moment we have large desalination plants in the major capital cities in Australia. So that uh, means that we do have some additional water security, uh, which takes away some of the incentive to, to recycle wastewater for drinking purposes. The technology's there and, there's, and the quality of water that we can produce uh, and the cost at which we can do it definitely makes it viable. Uh, it's a matter of whether the, the drivers are there now that we've actually got other infrastructure. Now, we've got time for one more quick question if anyone, before we go into the other Q&A. Has anyone got any questions they wanted to ask? One more? Uh, I saw the hand down the back there first, so I'll go with that one. Maybe if you can jump up quickly and I don't know if you've got a microphone, but speak loudly, that would be great. Louder. I'll just repeat this thing. Yeah, so the question is, is there a lot of red tape in the way of doing innovative things, really? What stops you? Is there... And I know, for example, that for a long time, the lack of plumbing codes around, you know, second pipes back in the house was a big issue, but red tape? 
Well, in terms of stormwater harvesting as a local government, um, I know in the City of Sydney we manage I think 50% of our stormwater infrastructure. So for us to implement a stormwater harvesting system, there isn't really any red tape. It's a matter of considering the scheme, its business case, the costs and benefits associated with that scheme and determining if we think it's a viable um, project and a, and a solution um, that we'd like to implement. But I don't think the red tape is um, an issue for us. I think there was one... Sorry, Daniel, you want to add something? Or no? I was just going to say the difference, if we're talking about wastewater reuse versus stormwater harvesting, then approval-wise, it's a lot... From my perspective, it's a lot harder to get a wastewater reuse scheme over the line. Um, but the challenge with stormwater harvesting is the actual consistency of supply. So you need to have large storages and invariably you, you get your, um, your rainfall at times when, when you don't need it, so in terms of irrigation. So that's the, that's the, the down, downfall with stormwater harvesting as opposed to wastewater reuse. And I'm going to take one more. I think it was one question from the lady at the back. Have you, you got a microphone? Fantastic. I do have a microphone, yeah. thank you. Um, I, I guess I wanted to just introduce the, the conversation or into the conversation the notion of businesses and their obligations around waste and water, um, particularly in urban environments, whether it's small businesses, medium-sized businesses, industrial um, parks and also um, particularly in regional areas, whether it be mining or various other large infrastructures, where they have the ability to be able to manage their water in different ways. And I guess we haven't really spoken about that tonight. I know it's a lot around sort of urban design, but businesses are part of that ecosystem. So it'd be great to um, introduce that. Daniel, you've been, I think you've done some innovative things with businesses in Australia around the world. I don't know, or, or um, have you got any examples where that's the case? People, business being proactive about that? There's a lot of incentives for in industry to reduce their, their, um, their wastewater discharge because there's EPA levies that get, that get put, on, put, put upon them when they have poor quality water. So they are, a lot of these companies are doing lots of work to look at how can they treat their wastewater and reuse it within their own process. Uh, and that, that financial burden helps to incentivise that. So I think we're on time, off time, Chris, so we might have to draw it to an end. But maybe, look, thank you all. I know Chris is going to introduce you now to a, a more interactive Q&A session. So, mm -hmm. look, thank you, and thanks to Daniel and to Stuart and to Lisa for participating. So thank you. Yeah, really.